and a very warm welcome to our 45th Security Thought Leadership webinar. This is where every Tuesday and Thursday at this time and sometimes other days and other times, we've been debating aspects of direct interest to the security world. And the idea of thought leadership is that we critique today what's going on in the, in the expectation and in the aim of getting a better type of security in the future. And today's topic is one that has very definitely been coming out of previous webinars. When things go wrong, being honest about technology. And I'm very grateful to Team Software. Actually, they suggested this topic, I have to say, for supporting this, uh, this uh, uh, webinar. Um, because we need to understand not how great it is. There's plenty of stories about that. We know how great it is. But understanding why technology doesn't always live up to the expectations. As usual, I've got four expert panellists. And in a minute, I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves. And as soon as they've done that, I'm going to ask each of them to make their opening statement. Three minutes when we get their views on this topic. Can I ask all of you please to, if you're going to ask a question, use the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen and do get your question in early. The <coughs> sooner you get your question in, the sooner that we can uh, come to you and uh, um, hopefully get your question live to, the, uh, live to the panel. Tomorrow, there'll be a blog on the website, so you get a recap. I'll be taking note as our panelists speak. So without further ado, let's get going and uh, ask our panelists to introduce themselves. And first of all, Eddie, please introduce yourself. Yes, thanks, Martin. My name is Eddie Sorrells. I serve as the Chief Operating Officer and General Counsel for DSI Security Services. Uh, we are a US-based contract security firm that specializes in security officers and technology offering. So thanks for the invitation. Look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much indeed. Eddie, from Eddie to Jeff. Morning, afternoon, evening, depending on where in the world we are. Um, thanks for the invite, Martin. I am Jeff Lujinski. I'm currently the Chief Financial Officer of FCS Security based in Jacksonville, Florida. We're one of the top uh, 20 guarding companies in the U.S. operate about 14 states. Prior experience in both the security technology world as well as the military. Thank you very much indeed. And to Simon. Yes, yeah, Simon Pears, a Global Security Director at Sodexo uh, uh, and also a <clears throat> Chartered Security Professional. Um, so we provide both physical and electronic security services to our end clients. Thank you very much indeed, Simon. And finally, Jill, if you could introduce yourself, please. Thank you, Martin. I'm Jill Davey, President North America of Team Software. Uh, Team Software has been providing workforce operations and financial management software to security and cleaning companies for over 30 years. I've been with the company for 24 years now. I started in a sales role and over time I've worked in all areas of the business, but my passion lies in working with customer facing teams, specifically as it relates to the topic today. Right. I work with our professional services team who support customers with implementation, training and ongoing support of our technology in their businesses. Thanks for having me, looking forward to it. Thank you very much indeed, Jill. Well, um, I was recently, someone wrote to me and said how great our panels always are. Uh, um, and clearly, we've done it again. So let's go to our opening statements. And Eddie, three minutes, please, from you, Eddie, on your thoughts on this topic. Yes, Martin, and thanks once again for the invitation. And thanks to Team Software for sponsoring this program. I think it's a very important topic. Uh, but first of all, I wanted to point out that there's no doubt that security technology has certainly made the a security industry much more efficient. It improves security processes and tasks and when managed and done correctly can certainly result in a more secure environment and a greater ROI for the end user. Uh, but I believe as an industry, we must embrace technology for the solutions and not just for the fact that it's there and available. Uh, it must be managed like any other process involving human resources and assets. And when I began, began to think about this topic, I came back to a very central and key question that I've experienced throughout my career. We must ask when using security technology, what problem are we trying to solve? And does this technology actually solve the problem? Uh, it may be counterintuitive, but we often get those two questions mixed up. Um, I've seen many scenarios where we're looking for just a reason to use the latest technology. 
instead of trying to find a real good solution or tool to mitigate an observed vulnerability. So I've seen a lot of cases where we're just using technology for technology's sake. Now, conversely, there are many technologies that we should be leveraging even more, but they often fail because we don't have a very clear and concise plan of purchasing and implementation. And I've seen a lot of technologies that actually fail or they wind up being utilized incorrectly because there is no plan, policy, or protocol for how to use that technology. Now, when that happens, bad things can occur. And those bad things can range from a financial loss, uh, the money that we invest in the technology, uh, to a negative customer experience. But one of the things that I deal with on a day in, day out basis is technology can even lead to legal liability if not used correctly. Uh, legal liability can be created or expanded because the organization is not applying that technology in its proper sense. Uh, if we look back just over the recent past, we've seen many forms of security technology that have become commonplace. We've also seen some technologies that have failed and never really gained traction. There's not a real plan or policy in place to use that technology. So as an industry, we have to look at the tools available, but also have a plan, a process, and a protocol to use those tools in the environment to make sure we're getting the maximum ROI when we don't do that, we see technologies fail or go bad. Uh, technology is very important to our industry, but without a plan and a purpose, it's going to fail. Uh, there's a great quote about artificial intelligence that I think also applies to all security technology. And it says, by far the greatest danger of artificial intelligence is that people conclude too early that they understand it. And I see that happening a lot with security technology. If we don't understand why we're using it, it's going to fail. Thank you very much indeed, Eddie. And I'll now go, Jeff, your opening statement, please. Well, thank you. And uh, Eddie, thanks for stealing half my thunder there, my friend. <laughs> but you know, when things go wrong, um, some may say I'm looking at, at this from being a cynic, but I'm an old army officer, infantryman walking down the trail, how to get ambushed. And I think that's the approach we need to take. I mean, after all, Technology should be a force multiplier, not the be all end all to what we're doing. So when we say our technology isn't operating optimally, we need to kind of define that a little bit further. I mean, it may be working to solve one problem for one person, but from another's point of view, it's, it's not. And, you know, it, it may solve a problem, but create five or six or 10 others. And, and that's the issue really I think that we kind of got to focus on. More often than not, the, the, the problem is a result of what I'm going to classify as a faulty purchase or a faulty implementation. And you know, why am I saying faulty? Well, because the CFO or the CTO made a decision because a technology or software salesperson said, hey, this is going to make your life so much easier. And you know, it, it clearly they did not define what the end game was in the processes it takes to get to that stage and, and what needs to be done to help that end user. I mean, you really need to look at, did an organization get buy-in from the end user? Because ultimately they know the job better than any of us in, in those management and decision-making positions. Also with the technology, how easy is it to use? You know, it doesn't matter how great or how sexy or, or what kind of information can be generated if it's not going to be easy to use because it's by human nature, people will find a workaround. You know, so ultimately we got to look at, you know, also does it still solve the problem today that it was bought for, you know, at a prior point in time? And is that still a problem or as you know, it didn't overcome by events. Is the new technology still supported? I mean, I think we've all been in a situation where we bought something was great and then all of a sudden find out there's a newer, greater version that's no longer being supported. You know, the other point, Martin, you brought up earlier was about, you know, the threats and, you know, inside or it doesn't matter, inside or outside threat. And you know, I was looking at one of your, your webinars from April and uh, I believe it was Monica Verma from Norway was, was a panelist. And 
and, and Monica, if you're listening, I'm very sorry. I'm going to paraphrase what you said. I hope I get it right. But as she said, no longer do technology companies need to focus on providing a better product. They need to start looking at cyber resiliency. And I mean, after all, it really is about not whether about you, will you or will you not be, be hacked. It's really a matter of when. And is it going to happen to you? or your customer, or one of your vendors. And so, you know, what do we do if that software, that piece of technology no longer starts working? And um, we need to prepare for that, you know? Do, do our people truly understand the process that the technology is trying to accomplish? You know, can they work from backup files? And when was the last time that backup file was actually validated? Um, can you do processes manually? Because sometimes you're gonna to need to do that until things are brought back up to speed. We gotta ask ourselves, you know, what's the audit process to mitigate risk, but you know, what's the audit process to assess competence as well to make sure people understand? And what's our training programs to maximize effectiveness? You know, so I just gonna kind of leave in my opening table with a parting shot it was when was the last time you did a drill in your what if scenario? Because ultimately, whatever we have will fail. And how do we continue to service our customers and our employees? Yeah, thank you very much indeed. Let me now move to Simon. Simon Pears, your opening statements. Three minutes from you, Simon, your thoughts. Thanks, Well, I don't, I don't think I need three minutes because Eddie and Jeff have said it all. Um, but uh, no, I will uh, try to give, give my view. So, Technology is becoming an increasing part of the uh, critical part of security services. Uh, in some respects, technology has now become probably the most critical asset in that kind of chain, uh, that, that chain. And therefore its failure now has severe consequences for, for the operation. What, what I find uh, and what I found for the last number of years is Quite often we find that the technology and the innovations are being pushed to us as the end user um, with, with, without really, and I think it goes back to the point that Jeff was making, without really understanding what that end user needed or required in, in the first place. And then what we find that we're doing is that we are adapting our ways of working and we are adapting our vision to almost accommodate the limitations on the technology and the software, whereby actually it, 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 these organizations, if the organizations take time to properly understand the end user, to properly test um, and, and to make it a solution fit for purpose, then that will have greater benefits. And I'll, I'll just finish on my, my, my last point, which is the end user training. The, 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 the consistent point of failure is the, the induction, the understanding of the end user, because qu quite often in, in the security sector, um, there's no point just training one person, two people. You need to train the team um, and, and making sure that when that churn happens, um, that training is refreshed. I mean, this technology now, um, it is so advanced um, and security officers are not the security officers of, of, of the old. They, they are managing technology of greater complexity. Um, I, I struggle with, with technology at the best of times um, and, and still having to, to, to rely on my children to help me. And, and so I, I think really understanding uh, the complexity of the technology, the training, the refresher training, the ongoing updates, and making sure that when that team is changed or refreshed, that training happens and that requires investment. That requires investment from the company that has purchased the software or the technology and it requires investment from, from the, the client or, or, or the bill payer. And again, I think there are, there are hidden costs that aren't built in at the beginning of the solution design, um, which is why then training is always kind of frowned upon or resisted because it's a, it's a hidden cost that has then reappeared. So thank you very much indeed. Can I just remind everybody out there in the, the audience around the world, Please get your questions in early, the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen, and we'll endeavour to get to you. Right then, let's go to our final opening statement. Jill, your thoughts on this topic, please. Over to you, Jill. You bet. And 
Eddie, Jeff, and Simon have set me up well. It seems our thinking is very aligned. With over 24 years in the software business, uh, in a customer facing role, whether it be in the sales process or supporting customers through implementation, I've seen many successes and also plenty of projects that were delayed, derailed, or in the end, unfortunately abandoned. And when I think about my experience, with initiatives that haven't been successful, there are common themes. And the most critical in my opinion is effectively managing the people side of change. Technology is a wonderful tool, uh, but without the buy-in and adoption of your people, you won't maximize its ROI. And to me, this means balancing executive level directives with buy-in from the end users to um, you know, Jeff and Eddie and, and Simon's points. We find that projects are much more successful when decision makers involve key end users in evaluating technology tools. And if the people who will be using the technology feel they've had a voice in the process, they are much more likely to be positive and engaged when it comes time to implement and use it on a regular basis. So kicking off a successful process, uh, for me, it starts at the top. When you know, we're looking at implementations and adopting software, helping our customers through that, it's absolutely critical to have executive sponsorship, communication, and involvement throughout the project. And it starts with educating the team about why the tech is being adopted and explaining the benefits and the importance to the business. If end users are fuzzy on the priority of getting through an implementation or using a piece of software regularly to support the business, they will most likely default to their current process and just stick with what they know. Which brings me to my final point. One common mistake decision makers and executives make is not fairly contemplating the resources or time it takes to effectively configure and deploy the technology successfully. They get really excited about the benefits to the business and want to get it in place very quickly, which is understandable. And while your technology or software vendor will support you through that process, it is going to take time from your team outside of their normal duties, like taking care of your customers or getting payroll done or getting invoices out the door uh, to complete those tasks. So setting unrealistic expectations related to timing and workload will instantly demotivate your implementation team. Um, so we find that having those conversations with your technology vendor, creating a realistic project and resource plan before the end of the sales process or the decision making process that can be shared across the team will set you up for success when it's go time. Jill, thank you very much indeed. Um, wow, some fantastic uh, um, observations there. I mean, so many questions. Let me get going straight away, though. Um, I think what I'm going to do, Jill, I'm going to come back to you because you made the point there about uh, people. And I just want to come to you for a question from you and Grant. And you and Grant asked, I think, a, a fantastic question right at the heart of the problem, all of you in different ways covered, which is what indicators do you use to identify whether an organization can synergize technology and human implementation successfully. Um, what are the warning signs they will not? Now you've all alluded to this and it's easy to say, and, and I suppose in some ways slightly obvious if you stand back, but that, aren't, that question's really a good one. How do you know? Well, it's a tricky question too, uh, because it's a human element and humans, are unique and have different perspectives. <laughs> so you're, you, you may be dealing with some folks who are really excited about change and adopting and implementing technology. And you may have people who are absolutely against it and just wanna keep doing what they're doing. And so um, I would say, how do you know is, is the only way is to get them involved early in the process. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes you have to make a change. Uh, I've seen that along the way. If people can't get on board or um, don't see the benefits to the business, if, if the business has made a decision to implement something that will in the end um, streamline processes, make your business more efficient. Um, if people can't get on board with that, sometimes changes need to be made. Uh, but it starts with conversation about the why and getting them excited about it and seeing how they come along. Um, but if you see signs that they're pushing back and always saying, 
no, I can't, I don't want to do it this way, uh, it may be time to have some tough conversations. Yeah, I mean, let me come to Eddie next. And uh, Eddie, is it tricky to engage meaningfully on these sorts of issues? Because on the one hand, there's the reality of commercial business here, okay? There's the reality of doing a deal. And uh, I remember uh, previous webinars, I was questioning this and uh, someone said, Marty, be careful, we're not too critical here. There's realities about getting a deal done and lots of pressure on people. And I wonder how much that can get in the way of doing what's best in the way that you've outlined. I mean, is that a problem, Eddie? It certainly can be. And I'm, I'm fond of saying that assumptions can be the greatest enemy of technology. And what I mean by that is a lot of things are assumed when we have a plan of implementation. We've mentioned a few of those already. One of the biggest assumptions is the ultimate end user understands not just the process, but the value of technology. And one of the things that I've employed in my career is not being afraid to ask the questions about what is the deficiency in this technology. We talk a lot about what it will do, but what about talking about the things it won't do? Uh, oftentimes we sell it to that end user that it's going to solve all kinds of problems without really digging deeper and getting to the heart of the matter about what it may not actually solve. So things can be tricky and delicate when we're really praising the virtues of technology and, and all too often we shy away from really talking about things that it may not solve. Uh, we talked a little bit earlier about getting that buy-in. Part of that buy-in is making sure we communicate the value to each person that's going to be using it. Uh, I've seen a lot in my 29 year career when it comes to technology, people employing things with the intent of making the overall security program better. Uh, that's certainly a noble intent, but when you get down to the end user, sometimes you see where that failure lies. I'll give you just a quick example. Um, one of the most basic forms of security technology is the electronic lock. Uh, anywhere we go these days, you see card readers, you see biometric readers, even something as simple now as a, a key punch. Uh, when I do consulting work, one of the first questions I will ask to someone sitting beyond that door is why is there a keypad there? Why is there a card reader? And many times I'll walk up to a quote unquote secure facility. Someone will see me on camera or through a window and just open the door. And I'll ask the first question, why is there a electronic lock on that door? Because I was able to access it just by presenting myself. There's no, there's no procedure, there's no protocol. So I think it can be tricky if we're not willing to really examine some of the deficiencies going in and mitigating those deficiencies before we try to move forward. Okay, thank you. Let me come to you, Jeff. Um, how realistic is it to expect suppliers to be diligent in these respects because look if if someone wants to come and spend a lot of money okay there's a reality here about taking the money and doing what's best and just as a quick side Jeff I gave a talk a few years ago and one of the people in the audience came up to me after said Martin good talk but I think you're naive he says let me tell you something I'm a good CCTV I'm the best person who does CCTV I'll do an excellent job always but if I go to a client and the client says I, and I think he really needs a fence. I don't sell fences. Do you really think I'm going to go on about fences when I sell CTV? I'll give him the best CCTV possible. In some ways, this is part of the problem. What's it realistic to expect from suppliers, Jeff? Well, and again, I think it depends on the quality of the supplier. Um, I've seen sales guys that just want to push their product and walk out the door with the, the closed order. And I've seen others that have truly cared about the partnership with the end user, with, with the client. And again, it, it, I'm on the purchasing side uh, in, in a lot of respects of, of technology side. And so I'm looking for a supplier that is, is interested in what it is, what my pain point is and how their product or service can supply it. Just as I'm on the supplier side, with security officers for organizations around the country. And it's critical to know what their pain point is and how what I have will provide a solution to their pain. I get bombarded every day with, with opportunities to, to purchase software that's gonna automate a process in my company and make it quicker and easier and faster and better. 
but no one has ever asked me, what are your problems today? What are, what are your people experiencing? What, what's your end game? How do you want to, to supply? So again, to, to your question, Simon, I think if you have the right supplier, you have a partnership who's looking at providing the adequate solution, it's not a problem. If you've got a peddler coming to you, then yes, it's, it, you know, the supplier is a wrong choice in supplier, irregardless of what the technology is. Uh, Simon, agree? Uh, um, to, to a part, I, I think also as security professionals, um, we also get, may get sidetracked about what is really the want and the ask. And maybe, um, and I think I've been guilty of it in the past, um, you get excited by technology, you get excited by, um, new software and new capability um, and you want to get it installed um, as soon as possible because you can see the vision because you can see the benefits but you haven't really taken anybody else on that journey with you so ultimately yes as, as a sponsor of that product i think it's great and i think it'll work but if i haven't bought the rest of the people with me on that journey then when it gets installed or implemented it's not functional is not used, is not loved, and then actually becomes a greater risk. Yeah, okay, thank you. Let me um, come back to Jill. Jill, a question from Dr. Glenn Kitteringham, who's a, a former panelist on this, uh, on this webinar. And, uh, um, and he's asking a question about salespeople, Jill. And of course, you know, salespeople have got clearly a crucial role here. They're at front, the line, and you know, they earn their money by sales. Um, and of course, I, in a previous webinar, one of the problems that cropped up was an organizing, organization saying, part of the problem we had in our organization, we didn't control the salespeople enough. I guess that's a biggie, isn't it, Jill? Is that a problem for organizations? I think it is an inherent um, challenge for organizations, at least one that I've commonly seen as sales kind of butting heads with operations and the people making promises that a different team has to then deliver. Uh, and so I think when you are purchasing, you definitely have to take a close look <laughs> and ask the key questions about, okay, what's life gonna be like after I say goodbye to my salesperson and who am I going to be working with? Um, could I maybe meet that person? Um, you know, we've made some adjustments to our sales process along the way that we, we talk about implementation before the contract is signed. I think that's, um, you know, as a buyer, ask those questions, drill into the processes, ask for a project plan, um, meet the team you're going to be working with, just to balance that out for those organizations that maybe not uh, are not as mature in getting synchronization between their sales and operations teams, um, you kind of have to balance that out for them. But yes, I think it is an inherent problem that many companies deal with. Yeah, okay. Um, Eddie, have you got any thoughts on this issue? And I'm gonna, put, I'm gonna use my words here, controlling salespeople, get them focused in the right way. Are you too aware this is a, a management issue that needs to be carefully um, thought through, Eddie? Sure. When it comes to selling security technology, and again, this sounds very fundamental, but one of the biggest flaws in the process is first asking what problem are we trying to solve? In the security industry, if we're talking about technology that hopefully bolsters and improves an overall security plan, we've got to first identify what risk we're trying to mitigate. Uh, what, what solutions are we bringing? But more importantly, what are the problems we're trying to solve? And I've seen in our industry, uh, because of the advancement of technology, sometimes we do have that backwards. We start to throw solutions on the table and then back up and talk about the problems later. What I've told salespeople in this industry is start with what the risk is. Uh, what is the risk profile for that property? What problems are you trying to address? Then try to find the security technology that's going to plug in and fix that problem. So from a sales standpoint, all too often we can get so uh, obsessed with the latest technology, we're almost trying to find a reason to use it rather than backing up and asking the customer. And Jeff, I think, put it very well. Uh, when you have someone trying to sell you technology, if they don't lead early on in the conversation with what problems are you having, then you may want to sort of back up and try to determine, is this technology going to be a benefit? So in the sales process, you have to know what you're trying to address before you address it. 
Okay, I mean, Jeff, I'm going to come to you next because uh, one of the things you did say in your opening statement was along this point, the CFO, for example, going too much on what the salesperson says. Um, I wonder whether really at heart here, uh, my words here, buyers don't know what they're doing often enough. And uh, it seems a strange thing to say, but this is not particularly unusual. It's cropped up in other aspects of uh, my research life. Um, when it comes to technology, you can begin to understand it. It's so complex and there's so much to it. Jeff, is buyer be, buyers beware, of course, but are buyers just not on the ball? Well, again, everybody's being asked, I think, to do more with less. And sometimes an, an action, you know, ticked off, puts that monkey on someone else's back. And it, it, again, it comes to a leadership team. Jill's alluded to this in, in the buy decision. You know, is senior leadership bought in? And, and as I've said, are your end users, does it really solve the problem that you have at hand? And, you know, Eddie's said this a couple of times. So when, when, you know, the CFO is making that decision and technology isn't his strong suit, um, he needs to bring in people from the team that, that are going to be supported by that technology. And in the selling side of it, the same thing. I mean, I, if I'm selling a, a product, I need to understand the operational people because ultimately if I'm a sales guy, I need that satisfied customer. I need him to walk away and say, Jeff solved my problem. He's, you know, he's fantastic. You need to meet him because sales builds upon sales. And if I haven't listened to what my, my client or prospect's problem is and provided the adequate solution, it, it, it's not going to help me in generating my business. So again, I, I really think it's, it, it's both the buyer and the seller have to drive that train toward getting not decision by committee, but input by committee so that the decision can be the right decision for both organizations. But Jeff, just I can ask you very specifically and very quickly to, um, on a point you raised. What is the reason a CFO wouldn't do that? It sort of sounds common sense, doesn't it? When you put it like that, what's the reason why they wouldn't do it, in your view? Because they're human beings. <laughs> and I've learned that just because it's common sense doesn't mean everybody does it. I mean, there are people that are overworked. I mean, as I said, organizations are, are thin. They're focused on a bottom line. You know, I, I hear what I want to hear. And so I say, this is great. It takes a long time. I mean, we just did a, a, a software transition and I'm gonna say it took us six months working with the vendor to close the deal before we even got to implementation because I brought each of my end users in to the different pieces of that technology and said, hey, you evaluate and come back, tell me if it solves your problem. That was a long, hard process. And so why wouldn't the CFI do it? Because they probably didn't make that the number one priority. And they probably have got competing demands on time and money and, and the resources at hand and take a shortcut. That's human nature. Okay, uh, um, let me come to Simon. Simon, um, I guess the part of the difficulty is here is that um, we, when, we, when we listen to these problems, right, that you've all identified, part of it is there is nothing sort of particularly surprising here. You'd think we would have learned by now. And one of the things you said on your opening statement, which I thought was interesting, was that there's a tendency to um, underestimate one part of the implementation that you're talking about training and getting to, team in, involved. From your point of view, why is that not obvious? Because um, if, if we include it, it adds cost mm. and, and therefore is unlikely to get signed off. Yeah, so, so from the, yeah, carry on, so, sorry. So, 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 so um, therefore, we try and pretend it doesn't exist and doesn't, isn't needed. Um, and we put forward the request for the software or the technology. And we hope and we keep our fingers crossed that everybody's going to understand it and get on with it and, it, and it's going to be intuitive. 
Um, because if we add another 10, 15% to that cost, it'll be unlikely that it's signed off. Yeah, and what's the remedy to that, I wonder? Um, for, I, I guess us as an industry to be honest with ourselves, that actually the true cost of the product or the true cost of the software is the, 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 the training, the upskilling of the team. And it comes back down to the, the importance we play on our people, the investment we put on our people, and in fairness to them, because th these people want to know it, nine times out of 10, how to use the system to its full functionality. Um, and we're not doing them any favors by only showing them 5% of the system. So I think that, that there's, it's about how organizations look at the end users and the investment in the end users, but also uh, how we front up with honesty and transparency, the true cost of the product with the training costs built in. Because I think unless we do that, we will never break this cycle. Yeah, thank you. And let me come to Jill because um, 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 Jill, you're, you're sort of on a different part of that process. I mean, I get this. I get as a buyer that um, it's all very well you being theoretical about all the ideals, but this is going to get in the way of a purchase at all. And I'm, you know, why shouldn't you, Jill, say as someone who's being um, actually going to make some money out of this as a, as a company, well, okay, we'll take that money. It may not be perfect, but at least it's something. I mean, isn't that good enough, Jill? It's, it's not. Uh, and I think Simon made an excellent point. That's why I was nodding my head yes <laughs> incessantly while he was talking. Uh, so many companies, when they're making that buying decision, <clears throat> they're so overwhelmed with the cost of the software and trying to, you know, get that into the budget that there's, there's a, a sentiment today that software should be so user friendly and intuitive. You think of the mobile apps on your phone. Oh, I can figure that out myself. I don't need my bank to train me how to use this app, but we'll do it ourselves. I've run software before. There's just this sentiment that we can cut out on training, but if you do that, you're removing a critical piece to the equation. You're, you're it's the other half, really. Um, you know, it's the technology tool that's going to deliver value. But if you don't invest in the training and the right deployment, then you won't get to those benefits or that ROI for the software. So really, it is equally as important as choosing the right tool. But is it a difficult sell, Jill? Absolutely, it is. <laughs> no. so you're, okay, okay. And um, what if they don't do it? Clients, I mean, user. But what if they don't do it? I mean, clearly, you're not. I presume you're not going to turn down a sale on the basis that uh, um, someone's not going to do it. I mean, but it, but but I mean, what do you do? What's what's the solution here? Other than Simon's point about everyone being on it's well, okay, but we've got a real world issues here and a, an economic crisis coming too. I'm just trying to get to the sort of how you get around this. Yeah. Well, uh, well, your project will be delayed and you will encounter issues and you won't get to your ROI. I mean, clearly we work with companies every day that are on all ends of the spectrum. You know, we've got people who understand and will invest and we see those projects go live successfully. And then you've got um, those that won't invest at all. And we have really serious conversations with those companies about whether it's the right thing to move forward if they're not going to invest. But many times it's somewhere in between and we work through it. It takes longer, it's going to cost more in the end, uh, and you're not going to get to the benefits. Yeah, okay, I understand that. Um, Eddie, I want to come to your question from um, um, Tio Guan Teng, and he makes this point that uh, um, uh, how do we find out, uh, um, how can one find out how as organizations can manage the response to problems are caused by technology? In other words, um, um, as, a, as a group, as a sector, we know these problems are occurring, but it's not an easy reference point. So I mean, people don't generally go around, and this is why this is an important webinar, saying, oh, by the way, if you buy this, you're going to have problems. Uh, I, I just how does one get an awareness out there, Eddie, about some of the issues you've all been discussing today, which aren't what are real, real life issues? Eddie, I'll come to Jeff next for the same question. Eddie first. And that's a great question. And I think if we talk about technology in a broad sense in this industry, whether it's robotics, remote video monitoring, uh, scheduling and payroll software, or trying to have an effective solution for security officers 
uh, tour rounds. Uh, no matter what the technology, one of the basic tenets of that is technology is not going to fix a broken organization. And so we have to acknowledge that up front. So one of the things that we have to go into the process with our eyes wide open recognizing is that we have to really do that analysis. Um, you know, getting back to, to sort of the sales process, when was the last time somebody really did a good SWOT analysis before going into buying a product or a service, acknowledging some of the shortcomings? Uh, that doesn't mean it's not a viable technology. So how do you get to really identifying those issues? Uh, the simple short answer is uh, look at it from all different perspectives. What's not going to work? Uh, I'll give you just a real simple example. Uh, most companies in the security officer industry now use some form of electronic tool recorder. Um, back in the old days, a DTEX clock has now evolved into app-based tool recording. If you go into it not committing to fully using that, you could even cause yourself some legal liability. I'll give you a quick example. Uh, in my role as a legal officer, I tell our team all the time, the good news about tool recording devices is that we'll know where the security officer is every minute of the day. The bad news is we'll know where the security officer is every minute of the day. And what I'm trying to really uh, impart there is technology can be a real foe if we don't always identify those shortcomings. I think there's some reluctance because especially the internal sponsor that's trying to get the company to commit doesn't want to really spotlight any negatives. This is going to work from A to Z, there'll be no problems. Part of a real good process is pointing out this is a potential shortcoming. And so you have to identify it not just up front, but all along the process. I know a good vendor, a good service provider will actually ask for feedback. How can we make our product better? If the company doesn't have a process to do that, it may fail in your organization, but future organizations may have a failure as well. Thank you very much indeed. I'm going to come to Jeff. Jeff, I wonder whether I can ask you just to incorporate a question from Michael Odu. Very, and it'll be very brief, Jeff, because we're running out of time, who asks about the role of technologists in all this. I want to get this in because we've spoken very much about the process, but I wonder what to extent these problems we're talking about here are in part technologists being very good at technology and not being engaged with the impact at the, at the, at the sharp end. In fact, them not being involved. If I can ask you to be very quick, just a minute if you wouldn't mind, Jeff. Again, I, I think it goes back to um, trying to anticipate where the operation could fail. Um, the, the technology understands what they bring to the board but we've also got to talk to Joe's point. People have been through the implementation before. You know, what were lessons learned from a prior customer, prior prospect? And we need to not be afraid to talk about the problems that will be inherent. Okay, thank you very much indeed. I've just got a very quick question to Jill and Simon. It came in in advance. Uh, this has cropped up in previous webinars. To what extent could these problems all be solved by a very good corporate culture? Uh, um, right philosophy, right attitude, get a good corporate culture. Does it all flow from that? Jill, very, very briefly, if you wouldn't mind, Jill and then Simon. Yes, I completely agree. There's a strong cultural element to it. Um, I think that is woven into involving people, communication, understanding the why behind it, back to Eddie's point, what problems are we trying to solve and effectively communicating that across the org. Simon? Absolutely. Down yeah, absolutely aligned. Uh, with that, um, the I, I think the the ethos of, of the culture, the the ethical approach, uh, again feeding down between from the board all the way down into in, into that culture of what is right, whether we're going to make use of this technology, um, and, and whether the end users can put it to maximum use. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just going to um, very quickly come to my panel, ten seconds each for their final comment on there. 10 seconds, please, because we're running out of time. Uh, Eddie, your final thoughts, please. Just 10 seconds. Yes, I think the point has been very clear today. If you don't have good policies, processes, and controls, technology will fail. It will not solve all your problems. It may create additional problems. Jeff, your final comment, please. Just 10 seconds, please. Again, Jeff. technology is a force multiplier, so we've got to get input from the end users in the selection. We can't buy in a vacuum. And then we have to prepare for how it could possibly go wrong. Simon, 10 seconds, please. 
a large proportion of the technology that is installed today is not used to its full advantage because we haven't trained and we haven't invested a huge missed opportunity for the industry. And Jill, um, it seems only right to give the very final comment to you. Your final thoughts, Jill, please. Thank you. Yep, technology is fabulous. Without people driving it, uh, you won't get to the ROI. Involve your people early and often. You won't regret it. Panel, thank you so much indeed. And uh, as Ewan has says, Ewan Grant has says, a powerful event. Thank you so much indeed. We could have asked so many more questions. You know, what the people write to me and say, what you always do, Martin, you always leave us with asking, wanting to know more at the end. That's the perfect webinar. Thank you very much indeed, panel. Um, um, I really appreciate those insights. Thank you very much indeed for the questions. Sorry I didn't get to all of them, particularly the ones sent to me in advance. Um, we'll try and come back to it. Thank you very much indeed, Team Software for engaging in a really important topic on uh, thought leadership. Very quickly, just to say to you around the world uh, that uh, nominations are still open uh, in the Outstanding Security Performance Awards in Kenya, in Germany, in the UK, and in Romania. Uh, um, Simon Pears was on today, has actually been a winner. Uh, um, and also in the Tackling Economic Crime Awards open in the UK till the 1st of September. If you know someone who's outstanding at what you do, for all the reasons we've heard about today, it's important we identify those who are really good at what they do. Um, and uh, very finally, just to say we go through it all again next week, and next week, rather unusually, we've got three webinars. On Tuesday, looking at the value of data-driven intelligence. On Thursday, looking at the harms caused by COVID-19 on the security sector. And on Friday, the impact of COVID-19 in Nigeria. That's 11 a.m. British summertime and earlier. We'll also be announcing the winners of the OSPAs in Nigeria. Normally, that would take place at a live event, but of course, because of what's been going, it's all virtual. So thank you very much indeed once again, panel. Thank you very much once to the audience. I know many people watch this again afterwards from around the world. It'll be on the website tomorrow, so will a blog. Uh, and meanwhile, if we hopefully see you sometime next week, but whenever it is, until we see you again, stay safe.